Matrix Barbie over I here. I know, I know. Is it kink or is it business casual? You don't know. You don't gotta know. Hey, everybody. How's that going? Hanging a little to the left then. So, okay, you set out to prove that the human body drove human evolution. Uh, what did you discover? One of the central things I discovered was that we are garbage at making babies, just the entire species. This is actually a flaming garbage pile. This is the technical term, right? <laughs> yeah, so we, you wouldn't think so, right? Because we have 8 billion people in the world, right? So you think that we are obviously good at popping them out, but no, 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 no. No, actually our pregnancies and births and postpartum recoveries are harder and longer and more prone to dangerous and crippling and sometimes murdery complications than they are in most any other primate. Well, except for a squirrel monkey, and we feel real bad for her. Um, <laughs> but, but also, also most other mammals, actually. We do, in fact, suck at this, and that changes how you understand the story of the female body, yeah? That changes how you understand what all this is for. It's not that it is our destiny to make babies, to be fulfilled or something. It wasn't garbage. mine. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I love my kids, but I'm good to be done with that. No, it's more... It's more like it's how we do it, particularly as a species, is so bad that there are many fail-safes, there are many things built in to kind of brace for impact. Yeah? Go on. It's more like that. Yeah, that there are ways in which our immune system has adapted because the placenta downregulates the immune system. So, you know, since you don't want to die of infection when you're pregnant, maybe your immune system runs a little hot the rest of the time, right? It may be the case that uh, we breastfeed the way that we do. It may be the case that we uh, have menstruation the way that we do. In each case, because we are actually just trying not to die. Oh. I see. And, yeah. and, and uh, from what I read, you, you found, what you found was that all of this medical research and science yeah. has been based on the, uh, what do we say, cis male sex at birth? <laughs> That's it. I'm progressive. Yeah, yeah, it's just dicks all the way down. So <laughs> Instead of turtles. Uh, right. Quite, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So this is true in uh, biological research. This is true in biomedical research. We are only studying males, right? And it's basically because this thing we call a menstrual cycle, which a biologist would call an estrus cycle, is just so messy and complicated, right? So you, do, you have this slope of hormones that's doing all kinds of things in a female body if you're studying mammals. So maybe just don't then? Don't what? Study them. That seemed oh. to be the solution. Oh, I see. You're just yeah. like, let's not deal with yeah. this. It was, it's not like there was any sexist cabal. I'm not saying there isn't sexism. It's more like it's not necessarily sexism that was driving it. It's more that there was a kind of unspoken agreement in biology. Oh, we'll solve this problem, this messy, messy chick problem, in rats mostly, by not studying the female. Yeah, which means that by the time you get to doing biological research that might lead to pharmaceuticals, well, then it may not have been studied on females at all. And then, in fact, many of the medications that are on the market today have never been studied on females at all, from rat to dog to often human. Well, I know I know so many women who went to the doctor over and over again with crippling pain, sent home, told to take a Tylenol, told that it's in their head, and it was endometriosis, which mm -hmm. men don't get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is what, what, listening to you, I listened to you on a podcast and you were talking about that and talking about how inflammation works different in a, in a female body and... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, the lack of studying endo, well that is just sexism actually. Uh, unfortunately, when, and we're just starting to come back around and really start to model how that's working. So there is some good news on the horizon but it's slow going. Yeah, but the reason that we didn't understand that um, women are more likely to wake up on the surgery table uh, is because we hadn't properly studied sex differences in anesthesia. Um, now, it's rare. Don't, I know it's nightmare fuel, but, but I it's... I always yeah. think I'm gonna wake up. No, no, it's cool, but like, um, it's very, very rare, but again, a bit of a sex difference there. So the moral imperative of studying female bodies is clear, but that book would not exist if it weren't for all of the amazing, often women and people of color scientists who are driving the new research, who are finding new things out, which are really cool.
Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to say <clears throat> about the anesthesia. I had throat surgery once, uh -huh. and uh, they gave me anesthesia, and I said, it's not enough. I, and then they didn't believe me, and then I proved it by explaining Brexit. It was around that time. <laughs> they were like, oh, yeah, she needs a little more juice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. the, the amazing things you're finding out. As you do. The amazing things, sorry, <laughs> that you're finding out. I mean, I couldn't believe when I heard you talking about uh, breastfeeding. Oh, and yes. that the nipple mm -hmm. has sensors and the, the mouth of the, the baby has sensors and they communicate. And if the baby is sick, the nipple will like readjust the titty milk right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is Cray. You want me to talk about the upsuck? Because I can. Yes. Yeah, upsuck. Oh, yeah. It's the, exactly the what it sounds like. U-P-S-U-C-K. So when, uh, okay, so here's a boob. Let's say it is. Fine. I mean, or, or here. But yeah, right. right? You know, and so if you are properly latching and you're a newborn, you are attaching on to this whole boob structure, kind of lamprey-like, right? And you're forming a docking seal, yeah? Yeah. And you form a vacuum by sucking in your cheeks and rolling the tongue back under the, it's actually very invasive to think about. I had to, I'm glad to be done. Yeah, it's like, anyway, but yeah, so what you're doing though is because you're moving the tongue under that nipple, you newborn, not you, maybe you, but not you, right? <laughs> that you're moving the focus of the, it's just physics. You're moving the focus of that vacuum back and forth in that enclosed space. What that does is it creates a tide just like you've seen on the shores of California, right? So you have the milk coming in and the wave on the top, and underneath the tide, of course, you have an undertow. So what's happening is the baby's spit is being sucked back into the mom's boob, where it then distributes through her ductal work and is read like some weird ancient code by an army of immuno agents and sensors, which then tailor the milk to suit. If the kid is sick, the milk changes. Yeah? Mm-hmm. The milk changes. It changes. It does. This is a two-way communication platform. It's an, you know, it's so weird because it's like we're like machines, we're like nature, we're like, I don't know, and I look at outer space and then I see like the inside of a human body, it all kind of looks the same. That wasn't on these cards. I'm stalling, but... <laughs> Oh, yeah, I asked You're you this. You're doing great. I like you. Thank Hello. you. Yeah. You're doing great, too. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is research getting any better with this stuff? Yes, yes, and that is the absolutely good news. I mean, it, it's often intergenerational. Yeah, there is some resistance from the old guard. It's not like that's new to science. That's kind of in any industry when you have a social shift, when you have a paradigm shift in understanding what you're doing. So there is some resistance by the people who are giving the scientists the grants. There is some resistance mm -hmm. from the old people because it's not nothing to change your mind. What is it to be told that for decades you may be a Nobel laureate, in fact, sometimes, you know, were wrong about something? That's actually a hard shift. That's hard to do. There are many older scientists who are leading the guard, but there are some who are not. So that's a thing. But no, new generation coming in, doing all the new science, and it's like the Wild West out there, man. Like anywhere you look for a sex difference in mammals, you kind of find one, right? Which also means that we don't entirely know what's gonna matter in the long run, right? right. You know, because it's new. It's not just cutting edge science, it's like bleeding edge science. Right. But it's cool. And it's, and it's moving forward. It isn't necessarily gendered. It's gendered in that it's like what your sex at birth is, but like you were talking about the male and female brain and that they're indistinguishable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, don't do this at home, but if you do hold two cadaver brains in your hands, mm -hmm. if this occasion happens upon you, I can't imagine why, but if you were, and the per nobody prepped you to say, this one came from a biologically male body, this one came from a, a female body, there's actually no way for you to know. There may be some minor sex differences in myelination, some ratio of gray matter in one region, but in the exact same brain in another region, it'll have the opposite pattern. It's more like a sex mosaicism. The only way to tell for sure is to literally shove them in a blender, sluice them down. We've done this. Sluice them down. Sluice. Count the cells and sequence the DNA. And you're going to have to do a number of them because females who have given birth to males uh, may well have some of his cells up in their brains just reproducing. Like some wise? Like some actual wise. That's how we know that there's chimerism. Yeah. I, I feel like, like I have I've a son wise. and his cells are apparently probably in my brain just doing something. I don't know <laughs> what. Right? Yeah. But but that is the only way to know, just sequencing the DNA, which is um, cool. You know, she's really cool, right? <laughs> um, it's really neat. It's like, like, 
You talk about science, but it sounds like beat poetry. <laughs> For a book that is all about the, the female form and the female body and all that stuff, you talk a lot about dicks. Like, I why do. so much dick? I do. There is a surprising amount of dong in this book. That is true. It's true. I mean, it's like a woman holding a cell phone. Like, did there need to be that much penis in here? Right? Apparently, the answer is yes, because vaginas and penises, not for your phone, but in this case, vaginas and penises co-evolve in all species that have them, which means you can't like talk about the evolution of the vag without talking about the co-evolution of its, um, I don't know, excitable partner. Right. <laughs> Maybe eager, earnest, earnest partner. Yes, <laughs> they try real hard. Yeah. I mean, it's like a penis, like an inside, an outside vagina? I like, don't they put them in, no, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Now I'm You'd no actually scientist. be surprised how scientifically accurate that question is, my dear. No, actually, when uh, the genitals are forming in those early weeks in the wombs, they all form from the same bud, essentially. And there's a diagram of it in the book, very nicely done. Yeah, um, and they're essentially the same thing for a long time. And uh, what becomes the clitoris in a typical female uh, Ooh, I just extends got a tingle out. when you said clitoris. I, I like, my I clitoris went, you Whoa! know. Uh, hello. Hello. You know, it extends out. Yeah, 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 exactly. So it's not that it's an inside out vagina, but it is true that it is remarkably from the same stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, um, why should men read your book? Should men read your book? Uh, I think so for their own good. So the thing is, <laughs> they can read my book and care about it. To learn about the human body, like all the books we read. Or we can cut off their balls. <laughs> this is a, a great ending point, and yet I feel I'd There's like to know if you would like to expound. I will. See, the thing is, let's talk about sex and longevity, yeah? The thing is, is that there are many ways to extend a male mammal's lifespan to make them live longer. Um, we know that females generally live longer and males don't across mammals, but the one thing that you can do that's more reliable than just about anything else is castrate them. Cut off his balls. And this is, and we know this because we have cut out thousands of balls, okay? For science, right? So we have done rat balls, we have done rodents of all types, we have done dogs, you've probably done that. Well, you paid a guy, but that adds like a year and a half a to like alley. a domestic dog's life. Pigs and monkeys and humans. We have the data in humans. The Korean court, the Korean Imperial Court kept very good medical records and had eunuchs. Uh, American men in the mid-century who were hospitalized usually for mental illness and because the history of eugenics is horrific, uh, were also castrated. Very good medical records. And a Central Asian tradition too. All of these castrated males lived longer, healthier lives than their regularly bald peers. And I'm not talking about a small gain. It's an average of 14 years. So why, why is that? <laughs> you know, Your space why, work is phenomenal. Why, why are so many men smuggling too little death nuggets? You know, like why are these the ping pongs of destiny? Why, why are these? <laughs> The actual grapes of wrath. Yeah. So, and the answer is, we are not entirely sure. We have some models. Some scientists are doing the work. But this is the actual future of gerontology, figuring out why there are sex differences in aging and why cutting off balls will make men live longer is how we're going to provide better medicine for cis men. And I think we can all get on board here. Um, American men deserve better from Medicare than a mass castration plan. Yes, that's a very good point. I mean, uh, mic drop, right? <laughs>